Hi, everybody. This is Professor Monty, and we're going to jump into sections 3.3 through 3.5 today. So let's get started. 3.3 says Chebyshev's rule and the empirical rule. Now, Chebyshev's rule, I, I have that written down for you. It says for any quantitative data set, so any set of numbers, and any real number k greater than or equal to 1, at least 1 minus 1 over k squared of the observations lie within k standard deviations of either side of the mean. That is between x bar minus k times s and x bar plus k times s. And if you're like me, you read that and it's just completely confusing. So let me kind of break that down and tell you what they're talking about here. So here's the idea. If I've got some data set, we'll put x bar right here. It doesn't matter the shape of the data set. It could be normally distributed, left skewed, right skewed. It doesn't matter. Let's put a left skewed graph up here. Let's say it looks something like this. Remember, if it's left skewed, the mean is going to be a little bit pulled to the left. That's what happens with left skewing a graph. So I've got that kind of graph. Well, here's what it says. Let's find a number of K. K, remember, it says is the number of standard deviations. So for instance, let K equal 2. Remember, it says k is greater than or equal to 1. So k has to at least be 1. We can't do k as a half or 0.75 or anything like that. We can do 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.3. It doesn't matter as long as it's at least 1. OK, so we're going to let k equal 2. Well, if I do this 1 minus 1 over k squared, I get 1 over, oops, let's erase that real quickly. I get 1 minus 1 over 2 squared which is 1 minus 1 fourth, which is 3 fourths, which is 0.75, which is 75%. So what they're saying is if I go two standard deviations to either side of the mean, so I go over here, let's get a blue pen, say I go over this way, and this is going to be x bar plus two standard deviations. That's not a 25, it's 2s. And I go this way two standard deviations. So that's x bar minus 2 times s. Within those two pieces, that's going to be 75% of the data. And the power with Chebyshev's rule, it doesn't matter what type of data set you have. You may have no idea whether it's normally distributed or not. It doesn't matter. Now, also realize what it says at least 75% of the data in this case is going to be within two standard deviations. So it might be more than that. It might be up to 100%. But Chebyshev's rule guarantees it cannot be less than 75%. And we could do the same with other numbers of k, 1, 3, 1.7, anything we want to, and we'll find out we're guaranteed the minimum amount of the data that has to be within that many standard deviations. Okay, so that's Chebyshev's rule. That's what's so nice about that. I've got another picture actually here. Let's see if I can paste this in. So there's another picture of us. They don't draw a distribution because they're saying, hey, I don't know what the distribution is. But if we look, they've shown with the red, hey, look, at least 75% of the observations lie in here between x bar minus two standard deviations and x bar plus two standard deviations. And so that's what I wrote. Notice if I plug in a three and I do the math, I'm going to get 89% is within three standard deviations of the mean. So we're getting a lot of the data within a certain amount of standard deviations from the mean. That's one of the big reasons we find standard deviation to kind of give us an idea of how spread out the data is. Okay, so that's the idea with Chebyshev's rule. I'll let you guys work with that. Let's go on to the next piece, which is the empirical rule. And I'm going to have to go grab the empirical rule. Let me see if I can grab this easily. We'll try to copy it here. Oops, already had copy. And let's go back and paste that in. All right, so now they give us the empirical rule. And we'll kind of read through these. Now, the empirical rule gives us bigger percentages, but read how it starts off. It says, for any quantitative data set with a roughly a bell-shaped distribution, the following properties hold. 
So for the empirical rule to hold, it has to be a bell-shaped distribution. Chebyshev's was any distribution at all, it didn't matter. But for the empirical rule, it has to be bell-shaped. If it is bell-shaped, notice property one says about, not a minimum, but about 68% of the observations or the data lie within one standard deviation of the mean. Approximately 95% of the data within two standard deviations and then approximately 99.7, essentially all of the data within three standard deviations. So one of the big things I take away from here is if it's bell-shaped, approximately 95% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean. So that means that there's only 5% of the population that's more than two standard deviations from the mean. So if we're looking, for instance, at people's heights, well, if we're looking at their heights and we find the mean and we find the standard deviation, we're going to be guaranteed right away that there's no more than 5% of the people, if it's normally distributed, that are going to be above or below two standard deviations from the mean. And then if something is more than three standard deviations away, that almost never happens. I wouldn't expect that in some, unless something weird is going on. Because notice that's only 0.3% of the population would be three standard deviations or more away. So that's the power of the empirical rule is that if it's bell shaped, we have a good idea. We have an approximate value of how much data is within one, two, and three standard deviations. The power of Chebyshev's rule was that we have a minimum percent that's a certain number of standard deviations away but it works for any distribution, bell-shaped or not. So remember when we did the Chebby Chevs? We'll pull that up. We got 75% within two standard deviations. That was a minimum. So at least 75% has to, but if it's bell-shaped, it's gonna be closer to 95%. Okay, so that's the idea. That's the empirical rule. That's what's going on there. So if I do a, a quick little example of this, I'm gonna change my pin color. So let's say, for instance, that we have a bell-shaped curve from our data. Now, just so we get used to this, it's called a normal distribution. It didn't really look like an eye. Normal distribution or bell-shaped curve. So if I have a bell-shaped curve, and let's suppose that X bar we find to be 20, and S, the sample standard deviation, we find to be two, okay? So X bar, the sample mean 20, the sample standard deviation two. So I can do a picture similar to this one. In fact, I'll use that picture since it's already a bell-shaped curve. But for instance, here, where it says X bar plus S, well, I know X bar was 20. X bar plus one standard deviation is gonna be 20 plus two, which is 22. So we're at 22 there. X bar plus two standard deviations, 20 plus two times two, 24. That's gonna be 24. And this is gonna be add another two, we're gonna be 26. Going to the left, I'm just subtracting. So for instance, if I did X bar minus S, 20 minus two is 18. That's 18. I can go again to 16. I can go again to 14. And so I know for this distribution, if X bar is 20 and S is two, that about all of the data, approximately 99.7% of the data will be within 14 and 26. So if I get a number that's 28, 29, I'm gonna say, you know what? I don't think that's, I don't think that number's right. Or if it is, I don't think X bar is right or maybe S isn't correct. So I know where the data should be. And in fact, 95% of the data should be between 16 and 24. So if these are grades on some sort of a quiz and you scored more than 24, you know you did better than 95% of the population. Again, assuming it's distributed as a bell-shaped curve. Okay, so anyway, that's kind of the idea between those two. Do pay attention to this formula. You will be using that in the problems. So for instance, if they ask how much data is within 95%, what, 
95% of the data must be where? Well, what you would do is you'd do a 95% equals one minus K squared. Then you have to go back to your algebra rules and solve that for K. I'm gonna leave that there for now. We may answer a question like that when we have a live session. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that there for now. We're gonna jump actually into that next section. We're gonna jump straight into 3.4. And as you can see, it's the five number summary and box plots. All right. Now what the five number summary is doing, it's trying to describe the data in just five numbers. And so the five numbers they pick are going to be crucial because we only get five numbers to describe all the data. All right. Let me break this down to where we're starting. There's something called the quartiles. And what the quartiles do is they break the data into quarters, or in other words, 25% blocks. So say I've got some data here, and I'm just gonna pretend it's a uniform distribution because I'm, so I'm gonna evenly space everything. But if I've got right here in the middle, my median, Oops. If that's my median, what I want to do is I want to start over here, end over here. This is going to be my lowest number. This is going to be called the minimum number, and this is going to be the maximum number. Well, if I'm just breaking it into 50%, the median breaks it into 50%. But what the quartiles do is they break each of these in half also. So I'll put a mark here as well. This is called Q1. It's the first quartile. And what happens with the first quartile is the bottom 25% of the data is below the first quartile. And then the next 25% of the data of the data is between that quartile, the first quartile and the median. Well, the median is also going to be known as the second quartile. And then of course we have the third quartile over here, Q3. And then again, we have 25% of the data between the median and Q3 and 25% of the data between Q3 and the maximum. So that's what the quartiles do. And you may have noticed from that, I listed one, two, three, four, five things. That is the five number summary. So the five number summary is the minimum value, Q1, Q2, which is also called the median. This is just supposed to be a comma right here. Let's make that a little nicer. Not to get confused with my one right here. So Q3, and then the maximum. And that's my five number summary. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna draw a picture of the five number summary. Okay, so before we build that picture, there's something I want to tell you. So back to this graph right here, notice the middle 50% of the data is between Q1 and Q3. So this is going to be the middle 50% of the data. And it's between Q1 and Q3. So it's nice about that, by knowing that value, we can say, hey, the middle 50% of the data is just this far apart. We already have something for the difference between the max and the min, which is the range. We know, oh, all the data is within this much number, whatever size number this is of each other. When we did the range, we did the max minus the min. Well, we do something similar. It's called the inner quartile range. We just abbreviate IQR. And the IQR is Q3 minus Q1, just like we did max minus min. And remember, what it represents is the middle 50%, not 5%, the middle 50% of the data. 
is within whatever the IQR is. So if the IQR is 10, we'd say, oh, the middle 50% of the data is only 10 away from each other. That's as far as the, any of that data is. Okay, so that's the idea of the IQR. So we have a feel for that. Now, we're going to build up to a picture of the five number summary, but we're going to look for one more thing. We're going to say, you know what, do I have any of the data that's so far away from the rest of the data that it doesn't really seem to fit in? So those are called outliers. So an outlier is a data value that doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the data. So say I'm looking at my grade distribution and say I have 10 students in the class and nine of the students scored between say 72 and 100 but the 10th student scored a 23%. I'm gonna look at that 23 and say, okay, something happened with this 23%. That it doesn't fit with the rest of the data. Everybody else did, did pretty well. Everybody else passed, but then somebody got a, a 23%. So then I may look, you know, are there some personal issues going on in their life? Did they, were they able to study? Were they sick that day? Um, should they not be in this class because they don't have the basics of what we have to do in here? I don't know, but all I know is that 23 didn't fit with the rest of the data. And so then I can look at that and say, hey, I got a data piece over here. We remember from when we found the mean, if I've got a number that's really high or really low in relation to everything else, it pulls the mean off to the side quite a bit, which is why sometimes when I have those things, I look at the median instead. Well, this data value is gonna pull my values. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight that in my graph of the five number summary. I'm not gonna use it as the main part of the five number summary because it's an outlier. So here's what I do, here's where I find them and then I'll show you on the graph what we do with them. An outlier is a data value less than all right, it's less than we go down to the graph and we start at Q1. And we say, you know, if it's below Q1, well, how far below one? Well, it's below that, so we subtract one and a half IQRs, whatever the IQR is. If it's more than one IQR below Q1, it's gonna be an outlier. Or, if it's greater than, start at Q3 and do the same thing. Add 1.5 IQR. And so that's how we would determine if we have an outlier. If it's less than Q1 minus 1.5 IQR or greater than Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. Notice the change one time I subtract, one time I add to get it going in the correct direction. I have students that often will put minus for both of those. And they'll say, oh, look, we have seven outliers. Well, we didn't really. They just did their math incorrectly. Okay, so just to note this, we denote an outlier with an asterisk. And I'll just draw the symbol because I don't know how to spell it. With an asterisk on our graph. All right, now we're ready to do the graph. The graph that we're talking about is called a box plot. That's our graph of our five number summary. So a box plot in general looks like this. We're gonna have a number line and say everything's nice and evenly balanced and say this is the minimum and then I have Q1, I have the median or Q2, I have Q3, I have Q, the maximum. 
So what I do, just put a dot at each of those places, draw a box for your IQR and draw a line at your median. And then just draw lines out to the maximum and the minimum. And that's my box top. So if this is nice and spaced like this, it says, hey, look, this is probably, since everything was evenly spaced, this looks really like a uniform distribution where everything's at the same height. But if one of the tails, these are called the tails off here and off here, those are the tails. If one of those is really long, say the one on the left is really long, then you probably have a left skewed graph. If the one on the right's really long, obviously a right skewed graph. If they're equal to each other, it's just very spread out, but it's not necessarily skewed one way or the other. All right, so we can learn things from that. This one that I drew didn't have an outlier, so I didn't draw an asterisk. But what I'm going to do is we're going to do a problem out of the book to look at this. I want to relate to a picture first. So let me go grab a picture real quickly of box plot. And this will show you what to do for the box plot. So if I go in here and I just paste this right here, it says, oh, here's how you, here's how you graph one of these. First, you find the quartiles, then you find potential outliers and the adjacent values. Now the adjacent values, suppose that example I was talking about where the, the person had a 23, and the next lowest was a 72, I'm only gonna draw my box plot out to the 72, and then I'll stop there. And then way down at 23, I'll put that asterisk. So if you have an asterisk, because you have an outlier, your box plot doesn't, the line doesn't go all the way out to the asterisk. And we may see that. All right, draw a horizontal axis in which the numbers obtained in steps one and two can be located above the axis, mark the quartiles and adjacent values of vertical lines, connect the quartiles to make a box, and then connect the box to the adjacent lines with, to the adjacent values with lines, plot each potential outlier with an asterisk. There's how you spell asterisk. I would have probably spelled that right after all. Who knows? Okay, what I wanna do now though, let's jump into the homework. I wanna show you a problem out of the homework. There's a lot of steps to it, but hopefully that'll help you be able to do your homework and it pretty much explains everything that we're doing in this section. So let's see, let's go to problem 24 and we'll take a look. And notice when it comes, eight parts remaining. So there's nine parts all, all together. So Q1 through Q3 they're asking. We've seen this before. I did this in an earlier lecture when we were just trying to find out how to use stat crunch to get some numbers but we're gonna go through the whole thing this time. So here's the first thing I'm gonna do. I wanna find the quartiles. It says Wayne Gretzky, a retired professional hockey player, played 20 seasons in the National Hockey League from 1980 to 1999. The accompanying table shows the number of games in which Gretzky played during a sample of 16 of his seasons in the NHL. Complete parts A through E below. It's kind of funny that he played 20 seasons and they're giving us 16 of them as the sample. So let's click there. I want to find Q1, Q2, and Q3, the quartiles. So I'm going to open this up in StatCrunch, and I'm going to let StatCrunch calculate them for me. I just need to know what they mean. So there's all my data, those 16 stat, summary stats, columns, because all that data is in a column. It says, which column do you want to use? Well, we only have one column, but we have to choose it so it knows what to use. Now, we want the quartiles. So let's see if they have them here. Let's see what they have. They've got notice and I, i'm scanning right past they have the median which remember that's q2 and down here lower they do have q1 and q3 so i will have everything i want they also have the min and the max so if i just compute this i'm going to get all the values i need again i'm going to use my little trick where i'm just going to take a picture of this so that i don't have to keep flipping back and forth so i've got my phone out and i just took a picture and then I can just pull that up and get the information. All right, so let's do that. So now when I go back, I don't wanna be in here anymore. I didn't really want that to be full screen. Close that down, get out of full screen here. That's not getting out of full screen. There we go. Okay, now I can put in my numbers. So if I look at my phone where I copied this, 
Come on, phone. It says Q1 was a oh, 72. 72. Why didn't that go in there? All right, so I'm in there. 72. I'll tab to the next one. Q2 was the median. That was 78.5. Remember, it doesn't say in StatCrunch, it doesn't say Q2, you have to go get the median. And Q3 was 80. And so we'll check our answer there. Excellent, good to hear. I don't need this up anymore. Interpret the quartiles. All right, so let's read them and, and see what it is. I don't, I'm not sure how they're gonna ask the question. The quartiles suggest that Gretzky played less than Q1 games in 33% of the seasons. Well, it's quartile it would be less than Q1 of the games in 25% of the season. So A is not correct. The quartiles suggest the average number of games played in a season is Q2. Close, but Q2 is not the average, which would be the mean. That's the median, the middle. So it's not B. The quartiles suggest that Gretzky played between Q1 and Q3 games in all of the seasons. No, that'd be 50% of the seasons. Must be this one. Suggest that Gretzky played less than Q1 games in 25% of the seasons. Yep. Between Q1 and Q2 in 25% of the seasons. Yep. And then between Q2 and 3 and 25% of the seasons and more than Q3 games in 25% of the seasons. So it is D. So we get the right answer there. So we'll click there to go on. Determine the inner quartile range. Well, remember the inner quartile range. We can just do that by hand. Let's see. Is it going to let me right here? Let's see. So IQR, Q3 minus Q1, which was 80 minus 72, which is eight. So now I can go answer this. If it'll let me. The inner quartile range, I don't need the keyboard, is eight. Yes, it is. Still don't need the keyboard. All right. Interpret the interquartile range. Well, think about what this one means because this one's pretty straightforward. The interquartile range is where you have 50% of the data. So the number of games played in the middle 50% of the season span roughly the IQR. The approximate difference between each quartile is the IQR. No, the average of the first quartile and the third quartile is the IQR. No, it's not the average, it's the distance. And the data span roughly the IQR. Know the data span exactly the range. So it is this first one, which sounded good to begin with, which was efficient because that was the answer. Uh, let's check that one. I'll have to go back to my mouse, check the answer. We're good there. All right, let's keep going. Ooh, determine the five number summary. I, ooh, I got it. I think I got it in my picture. Let me go back to my phone, look at my picture. I have a shiny spot right on the minimum. I think the minimum says 42. Let's see what it says. Um, 45. So the minimum was 45. All right. So the minimum, we'll just put all these in. The minimum was 45. And then you can tab over if you want to. Q1 we said was 72. The median, 78.5, Q3 was 80, and the maximum was 82. There's my five number summary. All right, so we got that right. All right, interpret the five number summary. Good heavens. The distance between the minimum and the first quartile and the first quartile and the median have more variation than the distance between the median and the third quartile and the distance between the third quartile and the maximum. Good heavens, what are they saying? So we see if we look at those differences, the set, so I'm looking at the five number summary, the 72 minus 45, that's a big difference. And then the 78 minus 72, fairly big. Those last three are all real close together. The 78.5, 80, and 82 are real close together. So this is true that the distance between the min and the first and the first and the median have more variation. There's bigger differences over here than there is over here. That is true. The distance between the median and third quartile 
and the distance between the third quartile and the maximum have more variation than the dis. No, there's not more variation up here than there is down there. That's the opposite of what we just said. The distance between the minimum and the first quartile has the greatest variation. Yes, the distance between the first quartile and the median has the least variation. No, the least variation is between the 78.5 and the 80, between the median and the third quartile. The distance between the third quartile and the maximum is the greatest variation. No two is definitely not greater than that distance there. So it was a identify any potential outliers. Okay, let's go through the math. Now, I want to be able to see the five number summary. So I'm going to write that down so that I can see it. I can probably just write it right here. 42, 72, 78.5, 80, 82. I can probably still see that if I move this up. Let's see if I can. Oh, of course, that's the wrong thing. Oh, well, I can still see it, sort of. We'll move it right there so I can actually read the numbers. All right, so potential outliers. Remember what I need to do first is the IQR. I'm going to do the IQR up here on the top so you can see what I'm doing. IQR, I already did the IQR. It's eight. I don't have to redo the IQR, but when I go and I look to find potential outliers, remember it's any number below, so we'll put a little less than sign, it's anything below the IQR, oops, gosh, I already started that one wrong, it's anything below Q1 minus 1.5 of the IQR. Well, Q1 was 72 minus 1.5 times the IQR of eight. Well, that's eight and another four, so 12. 72 minus 12 is 60. So any data value below 60 is gonna be an outlier. So we'll say here, anything below 60, these are the outliers, And on the other side, we do Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. Well, Q3 was 80. Just since I'm running out of room, that was 12, the 1.5 times 8. So 92. So also anything greater than 92. We didn't have anything greater than 92 because our max was 82. So no outlier to the right, but let's see if we had any data values below 60. So let me go and open up the data again. We know we had values below 60 because we know we had a 42, but there may be more than one outlier. So let's see, no outliers in the top row, 64, that's getting kind of close, but it's not an outlier. 45, 45 and 48 are both below 60. So we have two outliers. So here's what we were talking about before. What's the next smallest number after the 45 and the 48? Well, that's going to be the 64. So instead of drawing our box plot all the way down to 64, um, all the way down to 42, we draw it down to 64. So make sure you draw this correctly. I'm going to do an actual number line here. So let's see. We'll go... Since we go 42 all the way up to 82, I'm gonna go in tens starting at 40. So I'll say, okay, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. We'll do a 90 right here. I need to get this evenly spaced so I can see accurately what my five number summary and my box plot look like. Okay, so I've got an outlier at 42. We'll put an asterisk there. I have another outlier what did I say? So one outlier was 42. I don't know where that went. Oh, I put a 42 there? That must have been a 45, huh? I don't see a 42 in my data. All right. We have to, we have to scoot up and make sure that what I put up here in my answer. Oh, yeah, it was a 45. I don't know where I got that 42 from. So we have one outlier at 45, and we have another outlier at 48. So. Let me erase this 42 asterisk. I'll put one in at 45, about here. 48, about here. 
and then the next smaller number was the 64. So I'm almost halfway here. So I'll put a dot there. I'll put another dot at 72, another dot at 78.5, another dot at 80, and another dot at 82. I connect these for my IQR with a line at the median and then put a line out to the min and the max. There's my box plot. I see that there's two outliers. So there's two seasons where he scored a lot fewer goals than he typically did. I guess it's number of games. The accompanying shows the number of games in which he played. So there's two seasons he played a lot fewer games than he normally did. Those were the outliers. So, but it's still left skewed. We can see that left tail is a lot longer than the right tail. So it's still a left skewed graph. But now we can use all that data to go into the next part of the problem. So the potential outliers are, what did we say, 45 and 48? 45 comma 48. All right, we got that right. And then select which is the correct graph. Well, let's see which of these looks more like ours. Notice C and D both look similar because we have outliers, so it has to be either C or D. We have the two outliers off to the left. Uh, so then we just have to see. The notice Q, let's find this piece right here, which was Q1. Q1 was 72. I wish they had better markings here so we know which one of these is 72 because I can't tell. Um, gosh, I don't, I don't know what these hash marks are and they're too small for my eyeballs. Let's see. If that's 42 and 84, that's about 40 between, so about 20. So this would be about 62 right in here. 62 right in. I'm thinking it's this one. Here's the good part. If it's not C, we know it's D and they give us more than one choice. It was C. So you could count those and figure out how many hash marks there are. I'm old and have bad eyes, so you'd be better at that than I would. But anyway, we grabbed the right one. Important on the test to make sure you count and you see how much each one of those hash marks are, because you don't get a second chance on the test. You just submit it and it either tells you you're right or wrong after you submit the test. Okay, interpret the box plot. Select all that apply. So notice you may have more than one answer here. There's more variation in the first quarter than in any other quarters. Yes, that is true. The number of games played varies from 45 to 82. Yeah, 45 to 82, that was my min and my max. Gretzky played between 72 and 80 games in a majority of the seasons. Well, for the IQR, we went from, where's my IQR? 80 to 72? Well, not a majority of the seasons. He did that in 50% of the seasons. I think majority has to be over 50%. They're kind of they're getting a little dicey right there. The distribution of the data is significantly left skewed. That is true. And the potential outline observations fall far from the rest of the data. That's true too. So it could be all of them. I don't think C we should check though. And we shouldn't. So that was exactly 50% and a majority is more than 50%. So that problem took a long time, but it, it incorporates everything in that section. So I liked it real well. All right, so we got that one right. Let's just clear all this data off. Okay, that's the end of section 3.4. Let's go back and look at the lecture notes and let's go into the next section. So I'm going into 3.5, which is called, as you can see, Descriptive measures for populations in use of samples. So they talk about a couple things right here. The first is just they're talking about populations. We've been talking about samples up to now. But if I have all the data, I have the whole population. I have a census. Remember, we called it a census if we have all the data. Well, recall X bar is the sample mean. It's not a very good S, is it? It's a sample mean. Well, if I have all of the data, all data, we're gonna call it mu, it's pronounced M-U, 
It's a Greek letter for small case M for mean, but it's mu, and that is called the population mean. We calculate them the same way. X bar, remember, that's just the sum of X all divided by N. Well, mu is the sum of X all divided by capital N because we use lowercase n for the sample mean, rather the sample size, and we use capital N for the population size. And I'll, I'll draw that out in a sheet in just a second. But anyway, we have new terminology. So if we see a mu, we know it's the whole population that we have the data. X bar is just a sample. Similarly, they have something for the standard deviation. S, sample standard deviation. And the formula for that was S equals, we had the sum of X minus X bar squared all divided by n minus one, square root of that. And remember, we talked last time, we divide by n minus one, which we would divide by n because it's just the average distance the data points are from the mean. But we use n minus one because we're trying to approximate how much variation we have. And by doing n minus one, the de smaller denominator gives me a bigger fraction, gives me more sample standard deviation because typically if we don't have all the data, we're underestimating the population standard deviation. Well, the population standard deviation, sigma. Now, this is also sigma, but that's capital. And that's lowercase sigma. The capital one means you add everything up. The lowercase one means population standard deviation. Now it's gonna be similar. We're gonna add up the X, not minus X bar this time, minus mu, because we have all the population data squared. And since we're not estimating anything, we actually do divide by just N, not N minus one, because this time I have all the data. When I take the square root, it becomes the standard deviation. If I didn't take the square root, it'd be sigma squared, it'd be the population variance, they call it. Okay. So, and I will tell you when you're looking at this in StatCrunch, this is the non adjusted standard deviation. And the reason it's called non adjusted is because we didn't divide by n minus one, we divided by n because we had all the data. So, do bear that in mind. The one that says standard deviation in StatCrunch is just the sample standard deviation. All right, so that's the idea there. Um, let's go ahead and look at a problem. I'm gonna jump back into the homework problems and we're gonna do another problem. What I wanna do is I wanna look into another one of these problems. I'm gonna look at number 30. Now notice 25 is just like 24 that we just did. There's a lot of parts to it, but I, I wanted to give you practice on a couple of these so that you can really get the idea down I originally had three of them in here, and I thought, oh, good heavens, these take way too long. So I threw out one of those three problems. So now we're just back down to two of them. But let's look at problem 30. All right. Thirty doesn't look like I wanted to do. We'll look at it anyway. I think I wanted to do 29, maybe 31. We'll go back to it. Nope. Ah, this is what I want to do. And then I'll talk about what 30 was, even though I'm not going to do it. So the height and inches of the five starting players on a college basketball team were given below. That's all five players, so that's the population. It's not a sample. It's the whole population. Regarding the five players of the population, solve the following problems. Compute the population mean height mu and compute the population standard deviation of the heights sigma. Well, I'm just going to have StatCrunch do it. So I click here, open it in StatCrunch. It's gonna give me the data, there it is, and I'm gonna say, hey, I want to get the summary stats in the first column, variable one. Now over here, remember, it's asking for the mean and the standard deviation. This standard deviation, the sample standard deviation is not the same one. The mean was the same formula 
you divide by capital N instead of little n, but it's still the size of however many you have. So the sample mean always equals the population mean if you're looking at the same set of data. Now, obviously don't, don't get confused and think that if I'm saying, hey, I've got a population of 10 people, and if I take a sample of five people, that means gonna be the same as the population mean. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you look at these five people as a sample, or these five people as a population, they're gonna have the same mean. So we do need the mean, but this is the wrong standard deviation. That's for a sample. So let's look and see what we have. That's the only standard deviation we have. So I'm gonna pick these myself. I'm gonna say we need the mean, and we also need the unadjusted standard deviation. So I'm gonna hold down the, the control button and then click on my, on my computer. I hold down to choose those. I, I hold down control to pick one other one when I click. If your computer is different, you have to do something else. But now when I compute, I just have those two values. Again, I'm just gonna take a quick picture so that I know what I have here. So I don't have to memorize it because you know what I said about my memory is not very good. So now when I go back, and I'm not gonna need any of this because I already have everything. I'm gonna put in the mean, which was 75. Got that one right. And I'm gonna type in the standard deviation. It says, compute the population standard deviation to one decimal place. Well, I got 5.51. So since the, that next number after what I want is a one, it's not five or bigger. I don't round up, I leave it at 5.5. But make sure you round to whatever the, prob, whatever the computer tells you to round to. If I put in 5.51, it's gonna make it wrong. So I got the right answer. But notice, and here we'll do this real quickly. If I just go back here, so I had 5.5 as my population standard deviation. If I did this problem again, so I haven't regenerated, it's the same numbers. And I do, well, let's do this. I'm gonna go summary stats, columns. This time what I'll do is I'm gonna do the standard deviation and the unadjusted standard deviation. So when I compute those, you must select, oh, see, I didn't select this variable. Okay, there's the data I want. So now when I do it, look at the big difference. If these five numbers were just a sample, and they are just a sample of the entire basketball team, the standard deviation would be 6.2 rounded. But if I look at these as the whole population, which they are the population of the starting players, then it's 5.5. So sometimes there's a pretty big difference between the two. The smaller the data set, the bigger difference there will be between the two. Because if you've got 100 data pieces, you're probably going to have a lot of, the numerator is going to be a pretty big number. And then dividing by n versus n minus 1 probably isn't going to be such a big deal. Okay. So anyway, I wanted to share that. There's one other idea we need to talk about in this section before we're done. So let me, I could probably just put that down here. Okay. I don't need that either. What if I put this down? Nope, it's not gonna give me what I want. I wanted this. Okay, so we saw how that works. Let's get this out of the way. We'll go on to some other stuff. I don't know why that keeps coming up. All right, now there's something, we didn't talk about this, but we will real quickly before we get into this last piece. A parameter, is a value from the population. A statistic is a value from the sample. And I remember which is which because notice parameter and population both start with P, sample and statistic both start with S. So it's really easy to remember. So for instance, let's say, let's do a little parameter sample. And so over here, let's do 
the size. Well, if it's the population size, it's capital N. That's a parameter. If it's the sample size, oops, I wasn't going to call that sample. I was going to call that, let me erase this. Why is that not erasing? I don't know, it's supposed to. Huh, I don't know, that's not erasing. So we will just add to it. This sample one is called the statistic. Oh, because I, I switched my pin. What happened here? I did not want that pin. Um, oh, I don't want to draw, okay. Now I should be good. There we go. Um, I, I'm just gonna leave that there for now because I started writing with the wrong thing. So from the sample, we have what's called a statistic. So the sample size, here we'll scribble that out, like I can't see it, is little n. The mean, if it's the population mean, is mu. If it's the sample mean, it's x bar. That would be a statistic. And if it's the standard deviation, well, if it's the whole population, it's sigma, that's a parameter. If it's the sample standard deviation, it's just s, that's a statistic. So there's kind of the idea there. All right, so we'll use that for what it is. Well, if I hit clear here, it's gonna clear that out. No, that's nice. No, I don't have to get that. All right, back to drawing. Okay, so now here's kind of the last thing I wanna talk about. It's, it's called the Z-score. Z-score. Sometimes it's called the standard score. And what's gonna happen is where I'm building up to is I'm going to be getting values. We may find out a lot of times if they're normally distributed and we wanna find out something about how spread out they are and all that. And so what the Z-score does, it's the number of standard deviations. Some data point is from the mean. Number of standard deviations. So when we find it, z, it's gonna be x, this, that's the data value is x, minus mu. That's how far x is from mu. So say the average is 10, and this x is 12. 12 minus 10 is two, it's two units above the mean. But it depends on how big a standard deviation is. Is that, a, is that far away or is that not very far away? If the standard deviation is big, that's not very far away. But we divide that by the standard deviation. I put the wrong standard deviation. I mixed up my terms. So you can do it either as x minus x bar over s or x minus mu over sigma. If you use one as a parameter, the other one has to be a parameter as well. Okay, so there's my formula. Again, it gives us a number and it tells us the number of standard deviations an x value or a data point is from the mean. Remember, approximately 95% of data is within two standard deviations of the mean and 99.7% approximately of data is within three standard deviations of the mean. Both of these, that's the empirical rule, if bell-shaped, which we call normally distributed. I'll just call it normal. So that's why that matters, because now if I have some data value and I use it with the mean and standard deviation, I say, hey, this data value, this z-score is say negative 3.5. That means it's 3.5 standard deviations below the mean. So a negative z-score is below the mean, positive z-score is above the mean. But if I get a data value that's 3.5 standard deviations away from the mean, actually either way, that's gonna be very surprising. 
because 99.7% of the data approximately is within three standard deviations. So anything past that is highly, highly unusual. All right, a lot of material today. These three sections, they've got a lot of, and we're building everything up so that when we get into the next material, we have this stuff to use. So do go ahead and learn this. Um, practice, as you know, practice is gonna make you better and better, but remember, you can do this. So just keep at it, don't get frustrated, and you'll be able to do it. So until next time, I bid you the best and I'll talk to you later.